Uh, thank you. Appreciate those of you that stuck around this long. I asked Lee, what's after this? He said, nothing. Just shoo him out of the room. So I've got to be honest, I'm surprised you're here. And what's wrong with you? Why aren't you out at the pool? Oh, that's right, because you want to hear about metrics. Um, what I'd like to do is instead of giving a talk or a presentation or a speech on metrics, I'd like to have more of a conversation because I've spent my life trying to figure out metrics. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a lot of really bad mistakes. And over the years, I've learned some approaches, some guidelines, some thoughts about metrics. Those I'm going to share with you. But it's all based on my personal belief that there, are, there is no perfect set of metrics. They're very situational. What works for me won't work for you. What works for you won't work for me. So I'm going to talk about overarching goals that I have for metrics, use some examples, some stories talk about the guidelines I use to develop meaningful metrics, and then, again, talk about the process for implementing this approach. Now, one of the things, reasons that metrics are so important is because they actually can influence and actually do influence behavior. And the risk with that is that if we have meaningful metrics, those should drive meaningful behavior. However, if our metrics are meaningless, we will get meaningless behavior, which is what we want to avoid. So let me give you an example. I used to work for a company, and one of our divisions made this phenomenal product called manufactured stone. Stone made out of concrete that looks like it's real stone. And because it's manufactured, not quarried, it was less expensive, easier to work with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great company, great market, great products. But some troubles with metrics. So their manufactured stone came in two forms, flats and corners. Now, flats, for you know, those of you that struggle with this concept of manufactured stone, are flat. And corners would wrap around corners. Now, it took three times longer to manufacture a corner than it did a flat. The manufacturing process was actually pretty simple. It took about an entire day. It actually took about two minutes to paint the face of the mold, put the aggregate mix in the back of the mold, then they'd let it cure. For those, those that aren't in the manufacturing stone business, that means let it get hard. And then they would take it out about a day later, and that would be the manufactured stone. Well, it took about three times longer to actually form the corners in the mold than it did the flats. Well, the primary production metric, in fact, they were passionate about this metric was square feet per person hour produced. Nine manufacturing plants around the country making manufactured stone, the thing that mattered most in evaluating the performance of a plant, what was your square feet produced per man hour or per person hour? Well, because that was the most important metric, and it took three times longer to produce a corner than it had a flat, what do you expect they produced? flats, okay? So the result was their overall, this is a product that took a day to make. From the time it went into a mold until it was cured and ready to install, took a day, their inventory turns were four a year. Why? Because they were sitting on mountains of flats. In parallel with that, they never had enough corners to finish the job. So customers were calling all the time and saying, I got all the flats up, but now I've got to turn a corner, and I can't get my corners. Do you have any corners for me? So the corners were always on back order. The result was that their on-time shipment metric, which wasn't as important as square feet per person hour, was lower than 50%. Okay? But each plant was highly successful from a production perspective because they always beat their goal on square feet per person hour. In other words, the only job they were ready to deliver was if the Great Wall of China, which is all flats, needed stone. Well, faced with this problem, customers are complaining their on-time delivery metric is just killing them. They've tried to figure out how to solve this problem. Well, because this square foot per person hour metric was so important, so sacred, really, part of the company's legacy, they decided what they should do then, since their on-time metric was so bad, Let's change it. So in the old days, their on-time metric was an order is late if a single line item doesn't ship on time. 
Well, that's the one where they were scoring less than 50%. That's not going to work anymore. So they changed it so that in the new metric, it's on time if a single item ships on time. So their on time delivery score now climbed up over 95%. So they solved the problem. Because <laughs> they now have both high square feet per person hour and on time delivery. But if you really step back and you think about what really changed, did their performance change? Was their market performance any different? Were their customers any happier now that they could report a 95% on time? To quote the rock group back from the 60s and 70s war, what was this good for? Absolutely nothing. Okay. So if meaningful metrics drive meaningful behavior, did this primary metric of square feet per person hour drive meaningful behavior? It was important, certainly, but was it something that helped them improve their competitive adv advantage? Did it help them grow market share? Did it help them grow revenues? Not so sure about that. So that's what I want to talk about, characteristics of meaningful metrics. Let me give you another example. Another company, they clean dirty coal. Now, for those of you that are environmentally sensitive, there is no such thing as clean coal. They took dirty coal and made it clean-er because there's no such thing as clean coal. They had 11 plants around the company, or around the country, and they cleaned out mercury, arsenic, and sulfur from coal. So it could be burned in power plants. Actually, most of their coal was used to make steel. It was coking coal for steel. This company made an incredible amount of money when coking coal was selling for $200 a ton. Well, some of you may not remember this, but a couple years ago, there was an economic downturn. And <laughs> steel production worldwide dropped dramatically. And so the demand for coking coal dropped dramatically. And the price of coking coal dropped from about $200 a ton to $70 a ton. It cost them about $90 a ton to clean coking coal. So they were suddenly upside down. Well, that's OK, because the company president had read a few books on lean manufacturing. And he knew that if he could get lean manufacturing implemented, they would streamline and improve their processes to the point where they would recover from this downturn, that they could make money selling coal for $90 a ton. And so when you start lean, one of the foundation tools of lean is 5S. Well, the company president became enamored of 5S. Workplace organization. We've got to make sure that everything about the workplace is organized, clean. People can find what they're looking for. We don't have any rework because people get lost, don't know where stuff is, shadow boards, things like that. He also was passionate about employee involvement. So he introduced the metric of, for employee involvement, we should have five suggestions per employee per month. And he introduced that along with 5S, or workplace organization. So the employees, faced with the requirement to generate five improvement suggestions per month, the easiest area to make those suggestions was in the 5S. And so what they started doing was labeling everything. These are actual photographs. You may have a hard time seeing that label there. The label right there lost in the big Pepsi says, drink machine. For those of you that are not sure, that is a doorknob. Or that is an ice machine. Now, never mind that above it, it says it crystal clear ice. That's how you know it's an ice machine, because it's got a label on it. So employees got credit for satisfying the five suggestions per month if they labeled something. Now, I'm still not sure how labeling a doorknob a doorknob improved their work processes, streamlined their manufacturing processes, or somehow saved them money. But that's OK, because the important thing was that the employees got credit for an improvement suggestion if they labeled. Now, the photo I didn't show you is that in the men's room where it said urinal one and urinal two. Again, what's the point? But they did satisfy the metric. In parallel with this, the average plant 
endured about one week per month of being shut down because they had undersized their pumps and they didn't know how to maintain their pumps. So while employees were generating labels, no one was figuring out how to maintain pumps so they could keep the plants up for only 75% of the time. One more example, looking at software. On the vertical axis, you see the metric. The metric is lines per developer hour, which of course is one of the most important metrics in software development. See, multiple iterations, multiple teams, and I ask, is this a meaningful metric? Does a metric like lines per developer hour lead to meaningful behavior? If it leads to meaningful behavior, I can make the case that it's a meaningful metric. But what behavior does it lead to? Just something for you to think about. So anyway, like I said, there's no perfect metric. I've never found it. I have no idea if anyone else has. If you have, share it with me. I'm always looking for the world's perfect metric. What I have learned is that there are a couple of overarching goals I want to accomplish with my metrics. Number one, I want to measure accomplishment and not activity. In IT, in software, we can be busy every day and never get anything or never get the right things done. So I want to make sure we're doing the right things. The second thing, I want to continually get better at my work. I want to continually get better at IT. I want to continually get better at the craft of software development. So I want to make sure that I'm measuring processes so I can improve them. So I want to do things right. So those are kind of the epic themes that I want when I figure out what metrics to use. Will this measure accomplishment and not activity? And will this help me identify ways to improve my processes and get better at what I'm doing? These are my six acceptance criteria for metrics. So if I've got some metrics, or I'm pondering some metrics, brainstorming some metrics that might help me favor accomplishment over activity and improve processes, I want to make sure that my metrics represent reality. I want to make sure that they measure processes and not people, and we'll talk about that, are relatively few in number, are mostly non-financial, and that's just a reality of the world we live in, align with strategy, and show trends. So what I'd like to do now is go through each one of these guidelines and give you some examples and the thought process behind my including these as my guidelines. First of all, representing reality. A great philosopher Polonius from Hamlet by Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. A couple of years ago, my CEO came to me and said, Neil, you've got to read this book. OK, sure, whatever. I'll read this book. He said, no, this is the best book I've ever read on culture change. Now, that's interesting. I'm always dealing with culture change and trying to get people to change their behavior. So I got this book. It's called Changing Forever. Changing Forever talks about how to help people change their behavior. And the number one principle that he talks about, the second chapter after the introduction, is what he calls awareness. Another way to think about that is reality. He says, unless we're confronted with our reality, we will never change. Another way to think about that is unless my metrics expose what's really happening, it's unlikely I will ever improve. So the manufactured stone company hid their reality behind their metrics. As a result, they never got better until they changed their metrics. Interesting article, this is from Harvard Business Review a few years ago. These guys did this massive study. They surveyed and analyzed about 2,000 organizational leaders segregated them into different categories, and looked for the characteristics of the leaders that were the most successful, given a certain set of requirements to be considered successful. They looked at those categories, those characters, characteristics of those most successful leaders, and then they did further analysis on that. They decided that the number one characteristics of a successful leader was self-awareness, people that were aware of their reality. Without that, they were kind of out of touch about how they were behaving and how their organization was performing. All right, so I want my metrics to represent reality. The second thing is I want to measure processes, not people. There are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, I'm a big believer in Edward Deming's statistical process control. He made this statement a long time ago. He said 85% of a person's effectiveness is determined by the system he works within 
only 15% by his own skill. So if my metrics are not measuring process, I'm missing the best opportunity to improve. Because I'm not measuring the 85% that will actually drive effectiveness. Secondly, if my metrics measure people, not processes, and since there is no perfect metric, it is likely, it's possible, it's potential that my metrics will actually demotivate people. Taking a quote from Inside the Mind of Toyota, our real aim is to bring out the capabilities of each individual. The ultimate aim is to draw out people's motivations. I can't do that if people think the metrics are punishing them, are designed to embarrass them, to show them up, to make them compete. Does that make sense? So that's why I want to make sure that my metrics are measuring processes, not people. Besides, if my metrics measure people, I guarantee you smart people will figure out a way to game those metrics, to get around it to get around an unfair metric. And all metrics, in some way, shape, or form, are imperfect. All right, so I want to measure processes, not people. Let's return to our example. So here I've got three teams. One is solid as a rock. Look at that performance in lines per developer hour. They never vary. Now that other team, they're not doing so well. They did okay on the first iteration. They did poor on the first iteration, better on the second. Then they fell off again. So what does this metric tell me? Does it tell me anything? What if the team that consistently exceeds or leads in developer lines per hour, all their stuff is lousy code? Did it help that they were very efficient at writing bad lines of code? Does that matter? How do I compare their performance? What doesn't this tell me? The team that started low, did well, then fell off, what if they had the worst tasks on the face of the earth? So they had to go slower. Again, it's a metric that might be unfair and might not represent the reality of the situation. So I tend to avoid any metric that ends in per, fill in the blank, with a personal measure. Per person hour, per developer line, per developer hour, does that make sense? Because if it's per human factor, then it's probably measuring people, not process. And if I'm measuring people, not process, I'm probably missing out on my big opportunities. Our few in number. I was once asked by a friend of mine, the CTO of a large software development company, to come in and assess their metrics. He had a big metrics initiative. Got in the conference room with all his direct reports, about 12 people in the room, and they fired up their PowerPoint, fired up the projector, through their metric scorecard on the, on the screen, and they showed me on their Excel spreadsheet only 63 metrics they were using to measure software development. And I said, 63, is that all? And they said, no, if you go to tab two, you'll see the next category. They actually had more. They were just kind of a second tier. Their first tier was just 63. And so I asked them, I said, how can you possibly manage this? And they said, well, yeah, it does take a lot of time to gather the data. I said, how do you know they aren't in conflict with each other? And they said, well, sometimes they are. I said, well, how do you tell which one of these are measuring accomplishment, not activity? And they said, hmm, that's a good question. So we started to filter through them. Of these 63, there weren't any that were measuring accomplishment. They were measuring activity. Well, I said, you're already busy. So you don't need to measure your activity. You already know you're busy. So let's find some measurements that measure accomplishment. And sometimes that's what we're confronted with in the world of software development, is that there are a lot of metrics we could use, so we have to be pretty careful about selecting the ones we're going to use. So they need to be relatively few in number. My rule of thumb is five to seven. If I've got more than that, I probably got too many. Besides, if my metrics are to help me measure processes, not people, if I've got 63 metrics, then that means I've got 63 processes that I'm monitoring and finding ways to improve. I guarantee you there's not a team on the earth that can improve 63 processes in parallel. 
I might be able to take two or three on at a time. So that should guide my metrics decision. I'm just reading, coincidentally, an article on Monday that said that well, the number one reason that balanced scorecard initiatives fail, too many metrics. It's not uncommon. Balanced scorecards came out about 15 years ago. They were kind of a management wave, a fad for a while. Sadly, people got burdened down by trying to define so many metrics for their balanced scorecard. It would take them months, sometimes years, to finalize their balanced scorecard. And then there was so much effort involved in gathering the data to report up through the balanced scorecard that it became meaningless. The worst balanced scorecard I ever saw was for a health care organization. They had 150 metrics. How can you possibly make use of 150 things? Anyway, so we're fewer number, we talked about why. Now, if we want our metrics to be few in number, the smallest number would be zero. I think that might be a little too far. The next smallest is one. So some years ago, there was this book that was written, the only metric you'll ever need. And the only metric you'll ever need is how willing are your customers, whether they be internal or external, willing to recommend you to their friends or their peers. And so I've kind of taken that as, OK, I probably, one is too few for my number of metrics. But can I use the philosophy behind this net promoter score to come up with a set of meaningful metrics for my organization? And so I start with one, how willing would, be my, or would my customers be, whether they're internal or external, to recommend me to somebody else, or for my internal IT organization, if my customers had a choice, would they still work with me? And ask myself, in order to make that statement true, in order to score high on that single metric, what metrics do I need in place that would help me know whether or not that's true? So in general, I come down to three broad categories. And then my metrics fall into these categories. And these are pretty specific to me, so don't write these down. One is, do we keep our commitments? If I keep my commitments, then I'm probably building enough internal credibility with my customers that they would like to work with me again. Do I provide customer service? Am I easy to work with? Am I a joy to work with? Do I have raving fans? And third, am I a positive influence on others? Do I help them accomplish what they're trying to accomplish? Do I have that see-through responsibility? It's actually worked quite well for me in my career as a CIO to think about things in those three categories. It's also helped me avoid some of the troublesome metrics I've inherited or have been forced upon me. For example, percent complete. I tell my organization I will never, ever, ever report on percent complete because it's meaningless. I will report on how well we keep our commitments. Keeping commitments is more important than percent complete because complete, percent complete tells me nothing about what's actually happening. Keeping our commitments is kind of binary. We either do it or we don't. Percent complete gives me too much wiggle room to know what processes I could or couldn't improve. All right, let's move on. Are mostly financial. And the reason for that is we really don't have a choice. A lot of the work we do can't be linked directly to financial performance. Therefore, our metrics shouldn't be based on financials. There will be a financial component, component to it, certainly, but they should be mostly non-financial. Ideally, they align with strategy, because that helps us achieve the goal of favoring accomplishment over activity. So it's meaningless if the things we do advance the organization's goals. And last of all, show trends. This is a variable cost analysis I did based on June data from one of our companies. Interesting, I'm sure, but entirely meaningless. Total variable cost of percent of revenue is 59%. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But what if I show that as part of a trend? Now I can quickly start to make some judgments. How things are going? Are they going well? Are they getting better, getting worse? I can now do some problem solving and involve, find ways to improve that process. So again, that's the idea. Last thing, I want to make sure that my metrics show trends. So where do we start? Like Lee mentioned, I always start with my infamous 
yet incredibly simple, four-box model, purpose-based alignment. Because this is the fastest way I've found to connect my activities to accomplishment and strategy. For those that haven't seen this before, on the vertical axis, we ask ourselves which of our activities, features, functions, projects, to what extent are they going to create market differentiation? On the horizontal axis, to what extent are they mission critical? That gives us four types. The ones in the upper right quadrant are the things that are going to create market share for us that we need to do better than anybody else. Very few things we can do that will make us better than everybody else. Most of the things we do, most of the functionality we create, most of the projects we run fall into the category of parity. These are the things we have to do as well as everyone else. There is no economic benefit to doing parity activities better than anybody else. None. It's a waste of time. Sadly, over-engineered, over-complicated, gold-plated parity business rules, features, functions, and projects are a huge source of technical debt that are going to weigh us down and catch up to us at some point. So I want to make sure I'm constantly streamlining and simplifying those parity things. There might be some things that are not mission critical for us, but that will differentiate us in the marketplace for those we find a partner, and finally the ones that are neither are the who cares. How does this tie into metrics? Accomplishment is exploiting differentiating op opportunities and filling parity gaps. Does that make sense? We're accomplishing things if we're exploiting differentiating opportunities and filling parity gaps. The parity stuff is important because if we do it poorly, we'll suffer in the marketplace. We might lose those customers we fought so hard to win with our differentiating features, functions, projects, products, and business rules. So it's incredibly important that we maintain parity. If we're below parity, we need to fill that gap. If we're over parity, we need to fill that inverse gap. Does that make sense? So that's how I define accomplishment. So I sit down with my organization, and we come up with a plan for how we're going to exploit differentiating opportunities and fill parity gaps. Those define my accomplishment plan for, uh, for the next year, for the next quarter, for the next month, whatever my planning horizon is. And then I make sure that I'm measuring how well we do those things. Fill those gaps, exploit those opportunities. Okay? So that's the benefit of using something to align our metrics with our organizational goals. Helps us define accomplishment over activity. So let me give you an example, or a couple of examples. Here's an example from a specialty retailer. They decided that the way they created competitive advantage for themselves was through improved product selection. They segmented their customers into four narrow segments. For each segment, they identified their primary buying trigger. So now they have four segments. They know why those four segments buy. Now they align their product selection with those. So how does this tie to measuring software development? Well, in order to correctly exploit the differentiating opportunity of properly selecting products for those four segments, they had to improve their decision-making quality. So the people making product selection decisions had to be better at it. Well, now software development and IT had a role to play. So what mattered to them, in order to make this work, what IT and software development had to accomplish was to develop and deploy tools that would improve that decision-making quality. Another example, a health software company. The thing that differentiated them in the marketplace was product innovation. So the metric for them, what percent of revenue comes from products released in the last two years? That was their primary metric. Okay. That's for differentiating. How about mapping to parity? Well, especially retailer, they had overcomplicated a lot of their parity business rules, parity features and functions. They had overly complex back-end systems. They decided to replace those. And so for them, the primary metric for whether or not they were accomplishing, whether they're feeling parity gaps, was they wanted to keep as low as possible as they replaced those legacy systems, what percent of them had to be customized. For the healthware, or for the healthcare software company, since they differentiated themselves on product innovation, they wanted to free up as many of their really bright software development resources to work on the new stuff. So the process they wanted to improve, the parity process they wanted to improve, was their product lifecycle management. So they measured what percent of their software development resources were working on products that were three years and older or older. 
If it was high, they knew they weren't managing their product life cycles well. They, had, they were letting products linger too long in their life cycle. All right, just some areas to consider. I like cycle times, measuring cycle times. How quickly can we get stuff done? As long as I balance with some kind of quality metric. Business case metrics, market share growth, things like that. Another one I like is customer service because I think ultimately a lot of us are in the customer service business. Things like the net promoter score, do we keep our commitments? Are we being helpful or right? And how well do we retain customers? So as a recap of these guidelines, to accomplish the goal of accomplishment, not activity, and always getting better at my work, I want to make sure they represent reality, measure processes, not people, are few in number, mostly non-financial, align with strategy, and show trends. But we're not done yet. I know you wanted to. So here's how to get started. If you want to try out my approach, here's how to start. Pick a process. Not people, not persons, not individuals. Pick a process that you think needs to be improved. Ideally, it maps back to whether it's differentiating or parity, because that defines the design goal for your process and for the metrics you're going to use. Select metrics that will help you monitor and improve that process that you selected. Then try them out. We're agile people. We pilot stuff all the time. We try stuff all the time, so try out metrics. If it's a meaningful metric and you've chosen it properly, you've defined it properly and communicated it properly, if it's a meaningful metric, that process will improve. If it's a meaningless metric, it won't. And what should we do then? Stop using it. But if it's a meaningful metric and the process improves, and the process improves to a certain point, then let's go ahead and stop using it because I don't need it anymore. Let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I was hired as a turnaround CIO for an organization, widely distributed, had remote locations all over the world. The biggest complaint about IT was the service desk. People would place calls to the service desk and it was going into a black hole. They had no idea. Is anybody there? Did anybody get my service request? They would call a number and it would go to voicemail. No one ever answered live. They'd send an email. They would enter the service desk system online and fill out a request and it would just go in and they had no idea. It was the biggest complaint against IT. So I thought to myself, well, one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're providing quality customer service. This is not quality customer service. So let's come up with a metric. This is a process we need to improve. So let's set up for ourselves a goal. We're going to monitor this process, and our goal is we're going to give a response, not a fix. We're just going to give a response, a reply. We're within 60 minutes, we're going to tell people, we got your request. There's a human being at the service desk that knows you have a problem. That's all we wanted. Okay? Never mind, it took a long time to actually make some market improvement in that process. But anyway, within a few months, we were consistently hitting 60-minute 60 60 minute response times. So I said, OK, let's see how good we are. We cut it to 30 minutes. It only took a few weeks for us to figure out how to reply and respond in 30 minutes. At that point, we threw the metric out. We didn't need it anymore. We weren't good enough. We replaced it with a metric that now talked about the time to fix. Because the first metric was just, we're going to let you know we know you exist. Now let's work on our response times to get the actual fix in place. So that's just an example of how I can use this. Find a metric that will help you improve a process, ideally a process that will help you accomplish things. Use it. If it works, keep it until it stops working. If it doesn't work, you were wrong, try it again. All right, one last thing. We have to be careful with how we define the metrics because they do drive behavior. First CIO job I ever had, I had what I thought, and I still think is a brilliant idea. No one else thinks it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. So I thought to myself, I'm in the customer service business. I'm a provider of technology products and services to my internal customers. 
I want to know how well I'm doing. Now, I've got a service desk, I've got a help desk that's really the front line in gathering customer complaints. So if I could take that quality customer data, think of my service desk as my CRM system. If I can take all the issues that come into my service desk, categorize them, prioritize them, and feed them back into my, how I manage our systems and develop our software to support our applications, I could make a pretty big difference. I could proactively be out solving problems based on customer feedback. So I had this incredible, what I, again, I thought it was an incredible idea. And so I met with my staff, I explained this brilliant idea. We're going to take service desk data and we're going to feed it back in and we're proactively going to solve problems. So if the number one issue is I forgot my password or can't remember how to type my password, let's come up with a way to stop that from ever happening because if that's happening, it's frustrating for people. They can't do their work because they can't log into our network. Let's solve that proactively. So I explained this brilliant idea to my staff. And the person, Mark, who owns the service desk says, I'll take care of it, Neil. Take care of it. I said, wait, wait, wait. Let's set a goal. Let's set a goal. If this is really going to be effective, one of the results we should expect is over time, call volumes should drop. Because we're proactively solving problems, our call volume should drop. So we set a goal that we, within three months, our call volumes to the service desk would drop by 50%. That's how we know we've actually improved our process. We're proactively solving problems. Great. Mark went off. A couple weeks later, I was walking down the hall, and our service desk lead was standing there. And I said, great. I want to find out how things are going. So I went up to him and said, did Mark explain to you this idea? You know, we want to use the service desk data to proactively solve and improve problems and customer service and performance, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I got it. And I said, well, did he tell you about the goal? The goal is that the call volume will drop within three months by 50%. He said, we already did it. I said, what? He said, yeah, Mark told me our goal was to reduce our call volume by 50%. I said, well, how'd you do it? Because I couldn't remember any dramatic process improvements come up. He said, we just unplugged half the phones. So you got to be careful with metrics because they drive behavior. All right, any questions, any thoughts on meaningful metrics? Goal should be help us get better at our work, favor accomplishment over activity. To do that, those six guidelines I wrote up there have helped me. Any questions? Yes, a question over here, the man in the green shirt. Wait, wait, your microphone's almost there. It's practically there. Okay, would you repeat that question, please? Yes. Hello? What's your opinion on uh, escaped phase defects? I'm not sure what you mean by escaped. Ones uh, that got out escaped. to customers? Uh, so I have a popular defect right now with my management is counting the number of defects that were mm -hmm. originated in requirements and weren't found until development or were originated in development and weren't found until production. Sure. So. I would say in general, one of the problems I want to solve, I would love to have all my software development be right the first time. If that's my goal, I set that as my standard, right first time. No rework in software. Defects are a manifestation of rework, right? I didn't get it right first time if I have defects. So I'd ask myself, what metric could I use to measure the process so that I could get my software development right first time? So it, it, for you, it might be a good thing. I don't know. In your specific situation, it'll be different. But I do like metrics that help me find out how my processes need to change in order to get things right the first time. So how, what must be true for us to get it right first time? What processes will help us get it right first time? How do I measure improvements to that process that we used to get it right first time? And so it may not be escape defects, it may be something else, but I do like the concept of measuring the quality of my work until I've got it figured out. Did that answer your question? There was another arm somewhere, right there. Oh, he's ready, he's got, oh, and he wrote it down. This, is, this can't be good. So I really have two questions. One is, uh, 
you know, would conflicting metrics do not uh, do they not provide balance? Uh, like, for example, you're sure. trying to measure. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, also, in terms of metrics. Although I'd say this, I'm not sure they're conflicting metrics, they're balanced metrics. Okay, I want to make sure my metrics are balanced in some way, shape, or form, so that if I want to dramatically improve productivity, that's balanced somehow with a metric that also ensures that I'm delivering what my customers want at a high quality. So I've got to ba sometimes I'll have to balance metrics just to make sure that I don't go too far overboard. Like the manufacturer's stone company, all they measured was, what mattered to them was productivity. It wasn't balanced with anything else. And so I don't want an imbalance because it might lead to imbalanced behavior. All right, and your second one? Uh, you spoke about you know, pro measuring process and not people. How yes. do you differentiate individual performance in that context? Um, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So one of my fundamental beliefs is, and this is, it's based on my fundamental belief. My fundamental belief is that the people I hire, I hire good people, they come to work and they want to do a good job. Now if they're not doing a good job, my default assumption is something in the process is difficult, which means they can't do a good job because the process is in their way. Now that's my default position. So I'm gonna continue to refine and improve the process with the goal that the performance will improve as the process improves. Now that's not always true. Sometimes people are slugs. And so I'll get rid of people because they're the only ones that are struggling with this process. In, in my career I've fired people. Admittedly not very many. Probably fired for being idiots 10 or 12. Okay. So focus on process helped me a lot. Now I will say this, I want to monitor and measure processes, I still want to reward and recognize people. Because it's the people using the process that lead to our success. So I measure process but I reward people. I don't reward process, I, don't, I can't motivate a process if I recognize it. Does that make sense? So I don't know if I answered your question. I tend to I tend to reward teams, recognize teams, but I also sometimes recognize people. And again, it just depends on your, it, to me it's a leadership style thing. I, you know, one of the, there's an, I never really liked the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, except for one thing, this notion of an emotional bank account. I want to build the people in my group, I want to build their emotional bank account I want to build trust with them. I do that by telling them how much they matter to the organization, how well they're doing. Because at some point, if I haven't built that emotional bank account, I can't withdraw anything from it. And so I have to remind myself to recognize people and to thank them. And sometimes that's all it takes is thank you. Hey, just as a team, you were phenomenal. Then I'll see an individual who's on the team. I said, I know I told the team, I just want to make sure you knew specifically you did a great job. And I'll do that to everybody on the team, though. Does that make sense? Because I don't want to create any issues. So did that finally answer your question? It only took three ties, tries, but I think we got it. All right, anything else? Way in the back. So how and when do you know that your metrics are not working as per your goal, I mean? Um, in the case where it's a, a meaningless metric, I know it's not working if it's either being ignored or it's creating meaningless behavior. If it's a meaningful metric that we've used to improve the process, I know it's time to abandon it when we've achieved the process goal. So the priorities for the processes I want to improve and measure, those will change over time. So as, uh, once we got to the point where our response times were really good, I said, now let's go measure something else. Once we'd achieved our goal, I said, we're good enough at this, let's move on. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Anything else? We have time for one more, if there's one more. Lee says we have time for one more. No more? Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um.